Well, we're at the dressing room of Dylan Baker in the Barrymore Theater up on the fourth floor because Mr. Baker is in the David Mamet comedy November. It's a political farce as we move closer and closer inexorably towards political time in America. So it's kind of the perfect time to talk to this versatile, veteran, and very busy actor. Forgive me for slurring the words, but I'm just I'm excited to talk to Dylan Baker here on Two on the Isle. Always a political time in this country, it seems, isn't it? Well, when you know the nomination process takes a year and a half, it kind of is. Pretty amazing. And then once they're nominated, then we have to wait six months for the election to start. Yeah. No, we end up waiting four years for the next election to start. But yeah. anyway, congratulations, uh, by the way, on being in November. When did you find out that you got cast in this new David Mamet piece? Uh, I guess it was, uh, we started rehearsals uh, just about two days after Thanksgiving, uh, so it was very appropriate with the turkeys and, and everything. Uh, but I think I found out about it about four weeks, because it was probably somewhere at the end of October uh, that it was going to work out. Were you surprised that Mamet does farce? I mean, I've seen one or two of his before, but were you more familiar with things like sexual perversity? Well, that was actually a comedy, but uh, American Buffalo or The Cryptogram. Well, it's, I've done both American Buffalo and Sexual Perversity in small productions elsewhere. And both of them, I thought, were hilarious. But when I read this script, I said, oh, well, this is a whole different thing. And then since I've done this play, I've read Romance that he did uh, last year at the Atlantic. And, I mean, he's the funniest guy writing today, I think. I mean, I, I, I just, I loved this play from the first second I wrote it. And I think, you know, the audience attests to it every night that it's, uh, he is a funny, funny writer. Now, getting a handle on the character, you're the fellow who helps the president, gives him advice, and basically tries to keep him simmering down when he starts saying the worst things imaginable. So what was the time, the moment, or the thing that was said to you, either by the director or, or just from your own working on it, where the character clicked for you, where you found the key to what makes him go? Well, it's funny. It's, it's like the way that David Mamet writes is so bare bone. Uh, and so just get to it, get to it, get to it, that I think the thing for me that I, I came to realize was that no matter how many times I figured out what my character was trying to do, that Nathan's character, the president, would change all that in an instant, just by a whim or by an inspiration or by and so really my character of Archer Brown I, I and and Joe Mantella would I think agree with this is that I just had to like play combat you know competitively in a game with this other character to figure out okay where are we going now you see the poles what happened to never say die I saw the poles <laughs> you saw the poles how bad can my numbers be you broke the machine <laughs> Can these numbers be right? <laughs> these numbers can't be right. They're right. Well, then the hell with the polls. Must we let our lives be ruled by numbers? Do we defeat Truman? Not this time. Why? Why? We won the first time, Archie. Four scant years. Why have they turned against me now? Because you f***ed up everything you've touched. <laughs> We're a forgiving people. <laughs> Does he try everything, throw it up against the wall and see how it sticks, and then you have to react to that? Or is he more like, pretty, pretty set, he knows kind of what he wants to do, goes through it, and you work more normally as you would with another actor? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you say more normally, but I, I, I find that that's, us that's the usual way of doing it, is that people in the rehearsal period try the things. And then you adapt to that, and you try things, and they adapt to that. But with Nathan, uh, that, that's just the beginning, because an audience begins Nathan's job. Because he tests everything out on an audience and goes, Let me, what if I go here with this thing? What if I go there? And he finds out what is the funniest reaction, what, what, what gets the most laughs. And so, uh, to me, it's been... Uh, I mean, I, I worked with Nathan a long time ago in uh, The Common Pursuit, a Simon Gray play back in 1986. And I remembered him also as the kind of guy that uh, loved testing the audience and seeing where the reactions were going to be. And November is just like a, a, 
it's like a playground for him. He he's he's constantly. I mean, constantly exploring. He still is to see where where things are and what do they think about this and where can I go here. Well, I assume you are too. I mean, is that your process too, or do you after? Are you like Merman? Once it's frozen, it's frozen. <laughs> I call me bird's eye. Uh, no, I, I, I guess I, I try things in reaction to him, but I, I wish that my comedy memory was as good as Nathan's, because if he does something that works, he can do it exactly again, and I, I don't have that facility. What I have to do is try to remember what was my motivation, what was my, you know, and I, I try and figure out what, what were the sort of... Uh, uh, things going on around it that created that effect. And I try to recreate those again while making it real at the same time. But Nathan can just go, oh, well, this reading, blah, 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 blah. And, he, and it kills. And it's fascinating watching that. So I have uh, struggled to just keep up with him, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's a, a total joy because the other thing about Nathan is that he is incredibly giving. Uh, when he finds that somebody else has the laugh, he'll set you up perfectly every single night and, you know, and leave that space for it. And, but you know, if the laugh's not there, boom, we're moving on, going to something else. Well, moving on and going to, to something else, because you are so incredibly busy, you were in another play on Broadway this season, Mauritius, by Teresa, Teresa Rebeck. And I guess you're able to, and you're at the stage of your career where you can balance theater and film and, and some television that your law and order all <laughs> pops up all the time. So is that something that you can maintain now? You can do theater once or twice a year and make a living and, and it's okay? Or do you have to do like a full year of movies just to do theater for a couple of months? <laughs> I sure hope I can do some more theater. Uh, it's, it's not easy. It's really not easy. Uh, just because living in Manhattan is, um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but it's freaking expensive. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, I've been lucky this year in that there's, it's two plays that I really wanted to do. I loved both of them for, for different reasons. And they have afforded me to stay home during my daughter's entire freshman year in high school. So that has been fantastic. I haven't had to be open, you know, uh, someplace up in Vancouver or Toronto or God knows where in Canada where they do everything. You know. <laughs> And, uh, or California, so it's been nice. Right, well, let's get to the Entertainment Tonight stuff. So here's the personal thing. So you uh, married for ever? For uh, <laughs> just over 20 years. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. And Thanks. one daughter? or One daughter, yes, and she's uh, 15 years old, a freshman in high school. And if she says, Daddy, I want to be an actress? It would surprise us all a lot because she has no real interest in it. Uh, she's kind of looked at uh, uh, this all and uh, she enjoys it. She loves coming to opening nights, loves to you know, see first films and stuff and watch things with us in it. But not really interested in it herself. She, she loves animals. She's still exploring. She loves art. She's a fabulous artist. So you know, I think she'll find her Art Johnson somewhere else than acting, which is fine with me. <laughs> so, and, and speaking of other things, I mean, you can't, actors tend to let performance and getting ready for this role and auditioning be their entire lives. Do you make time for other hobbies and other interests and keeping, you know, the, the brain working with other stuff so there's more input? You know, I... I so wish this is the moment when I'd like to say, well, I have a shop, well, you know, someplace doing the, I, I know I have no hobbies. I have no life. But what we do have very luckily is we've been able to piece together a few dollars and we got a house in the country. And so we go up there and now I just have the one day off a week, but I try to run up there on a Sunday after a matinee. And I'll just dicker around that house and putter and fix this and do that. And I've in the garage, I have fixed myself a bit of a, a workplace. And uh, that is my hobby, to go up there and work on something that constantly needs attention. So. Kind of like a play, actually. <laughs> so have you still, now that it's been running a few weeks, November, uh, at the uh, Barrymore Theater, do... I mean, as you said, Nathan Lang is always still looking, engaging the audience, but do things change? Do they shift? Do, do, does the play feel different on different nights? Have you discovered new things to it? Well, I don't, I don't know how delicate this is, but uh, sometime after we uh, stopped having the governor of New York that we had and to the time that we had the new governor, there's a line at the end of the play when 
Uh, Laurie, the speechwriter, says, Sir, can I kiss you? And he says, In the Oval Office? Get the mm, out of here. Well, all of a sudden, after that thing happened uh, with uh, the governor, uh, he, she said, Can I kiss you? And he said, In the Oval Office? And the audience started laughing. And, and we were all like, Oh, and, and, you know, it was very clear uh, that uh, they had, uh, you know, they thought we had maybe inserted that in the play or something, you know, as a little comment on, you know, shenanigans at high places. But uh, we all we all appreciated that. Uh, but and it, na- even now, it still gets a laugh every now and then. This sort of rumbling. <laughs> Now, also the other typical kind of actor question is because you balanced, you're currently doing very modern and new plays, which is great, but you've also done classical stuff. I, I, I believe I saw you in La Bette. Um, yeah. Many, you, I mean, that was a new play, but it was I old. Play on Broadway before Mauritius. Uh, La Bette was back in the first Gulf War oh, yeah. in 91, yeah. By David Hurston, yeah. So are there roles in the classical mode that you've always wanted? You know, is there a Shakespeare you've always wanted to do or, or that kind of thing or a Shaw or a... Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, I've been talking to Doug Hughes about a couple of things, but one play I love is, a, is the uh, School for Scandal, and I would love to play Sir Peter Teasel in that sometime. So, Doug, let's do it. But uh, uh, this past summer, my, my, my wife Becky Ann Baker and I were able to be up at uh, the Williamstown Theater Festival doing The Corners Green, and uh, that's a great role, a great play. It's an old Welsh play written by her godfather, uh, Emlyn Williams, uh, about a young boy that escapes from the mines through being taught by this uh, this teacher that takes a shine to him and uh, sees that he has talents. And it mimics uh, Richard Burton's story as well. So uh, they all came from this little town in Wales. And there was Kate Burton with her son playing, uh, Morgan Ritchie playing the part. And I, I played the part of this squire who sort of owned everything and loved the little children and keeping them working in the mine. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? So that was fun. And Becky got to play the sort of shrewd uh, one-liner uh, a, a, you know, cook made to, the, uh, to Kate Burton. So. But that does then beg the other question. You act sometimes with your wife. What is that like, taking work and bringing that into family? Sometimes that's great, sometimes... Mm. Well, it's been good uh, uh, all the time that we've been on stage together. Uh, the one time that it was a little dicey is when I directed her in a play. And I was like going, oh, yeah, yeah, come over and do this. And she finally pulled me aside. If you tell me what to do one more time, I'm going to kick your you know, so we had to we had to work that out. <laughs> Honey, I'm the director. I have to tell you, but uh, uh, it, it, we've we've en- enjoyed working together very much. And we always, when we have auditions, we show them to each other and say, "What would you do?" And uh, we have uh, great respect for each other that way. She's about to do Showboat at uh, Carnegie Hall. She's playing the the part that Elaine Stritch played in the last arri- uh, revival. Marthy. Marthy. Yeah. Marthy. Yeah. Yeah. Marthy. Yeah. Marthy. Marthy. Parthy. Parthy. Something That's like it. that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess to, to finish up our wonderful interview here with, with uh, Dylan Baker, I guess um, the, the other question is, if you had it to do all over again, and you were, but you were still going to do the acting, are there things that you would have changed in the way you would approach it or, or how you got into it? I, you know, I, I had so much luck along the way, and one of the greatest things I had, I, the one thing I look back on is I wish I could have told Nico Sakharopoulos how much I loved him, and how much he did for me. He was the original uh, artistic director at the Williamstown Theater Festival, and he just sort of grabbed a hold of me and said, come up here, be up here over the summer, and kept giving me, slipping me plays and saying, take a look at this. And it's like, not about heroes. I was like, what is this? It's like, just, just read it, just read it. And I get to the summer, and there's Ed Herman, who's going to star in it with uh, Jalko Ivanak. And I said, hey, Ed, I, I read that play, not about heroes. And he said, why did Nikos give you that? That that Jelko is playing that part, and uh, so I said, no, nah, it's no problem. I just, you know, he he handed it to me to read, and then Jelko called Ed up and said, I can't do it. I'm doing this other play. I just can't do it. So Ed came to me and said, Let's do it. Let's just read through the play, and we did one read through that was like a first rehearsal with Diane Weist who directed it, and we were all sudden in the play, and it ended up going off Broadway for the first thing I did in New York. So Nikos basically handed me a career. 
on a platter. And I, I don't think I ever got to thank him properly. I mean, no, no young kid ever thanks somebody enough. But other than that, I mean, I, I just had people in my corner a lot, which has been uh, very, very helpful all the way. Well, thank you so much, Dylan Baker. It's been absolutely a pleasure. Good to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Come see November, by the way. It's really funny. <laughs>